Disc 5 Chapter 21 My one feeling of regret at this time was that Josephine was out of it all. She would have enjoyed it all so much. Her recovery was rapid, and she was expected to be back any day now, but nevertheless she missed another event of importance. I was in the rock garden one morning with Sophia and Brenda, when a car drew up at the front door. Taverner and Sergeant Lamb got out of it. They went up the steps and into the house. Brenda stood still, staring at the car. It's those men, he said. They've come back. And I thought they'd given up. I thought it was all over. I saw her shiver. She had joined us about ten minutes before. Wrapped in her chinchilla coat, she had said, If I don't get some air and exercise, I shall go mad. If I go outside the gate, there's always a reporter waiting to pounce on me. It's like being besieged. Will it go on forever? Sophia said that she supposed the reporters would soon get tired of it. You can go out in the car, she added. I tell you, I want to get some exercise. Then she said abruptly, You're giving Lawrence the sack, Sophia. Why? Sophia answered quietly, We're making other arrangements for Eustace, and Josephine is going to Switzerland. Well, you've upset Lawrence very much. He feels you don't trust him. Sophia did not reply, and it was at that moment that Taverner's car had arrived. Standing there, shivering in the moist autumn air, Brenda muttered, What do they want? Why have they come? I thought I knew why they had come. I said nothing to Sophia of the letters I had found by the system, but I knew that they had gone to the Director of Public Prosecutions. Taverner came out of the house again. He walked across the drive and the lawn towards us. Brenda shivered more violently. What does he want? she repeated nervously. What does he want? Then Taverner was with us. He spoke curtly, in his official voice, using official phrases. I have a warrant here for your arrest. You are charged with administering Esserine to Aristide Leonides on September the 19th last. I must warn you that anything you say may be used in evidence at your trial. And then Brenda went to pieces. She screamed, she clung to me, she cried out, No! No, no, it isn't true! Charles, tell them it isn't true! I didn't do it! I didn't know anything about it! It's all a plot! Don't let them take me away! It isn't true, I tell you, it isn't true! I haven't done anything! It was horrible, unbelievably horrible. I tried to soothe her. I unfastened her fingers from my arm. I told her that I would arrange for a lawyer for her, that she was to keep calm, that a lawyer would arrange everything. Taverner took her gently under the elbow. Come along, Mrs. Leonides, he said. You don't want a hat, do you? No? Then we'll go off right away. She pulled back, staring at him with enormous cat's eyes. Lawrence, she said. What have you done to Lawrence? Mr. Lawrence Brown is also under arrest, said Taverner. She wilted then. Her body seemed to collapse and shrink. The tears poured down her face. She went away quietly with Taverner across the lawn to the car. I saw Lawrence Brown and Sergeant Lamb come out of the house. They all got into the car. The car drove away. I drew a deep breath and turned to Sophia. She was very pale, and there was a look of distress on her face. It's horrible, Charles, she said. It's quite horrible. I know. You must get her a really first-class solicitor. The best there is. She, she must have all the help possible. One doesn't realize... I said, what these things are like. I've never seen anyone arrested before. I know. One has no idea. We were both silent. I was thinking of the desperate terror on Brenda's face. It had seemed familiar to me, and suddenly I realized why. It was the same expression that I had seen on Magda Leonides's face the first day I had come to the crooked house when she had been talking about the Edith Thompson play. And then, she had said, sheer terror. Don't you think so? Sheer terror. That was what had been on Brenda's face. Brenda was not a fighter. I wondered that she had ever had the nerve to do murder. But possibly she had not. Possibly it had been Lawrence Brown, with his persecution mania, his unstable personality, who had put the contents of one little bottle into another little bottle. A simple, easy act to free the woman he loved. 
So, it's over, said Sophia. She sighed deeply, then asked, But why arrest them now? I thought there wasn't enough evidence. A certain amount of evidence has come to light. Letters. You mean love letters between them? Yes. What fools people are to keep these things. Yes, indeed. Fools. The kind of folly which never seemed to profit by the experience of others. You couldn't open a daily newspaper without coming across some instance of that folly. The passion to keep the written word, the written assurance of love. It's quite beastly, Sophia, I said, but it's no good minding about it. After all, it's what we've been hoping for all along, isn't it? It's what you said that first night at Mario's. You said it would be all right if the right person had killed your grandfather. Brenda was the right person, wasn't she? Brenda or Lawrence? Don't, Charles. You make me feel awful. But we must be sensible. We can marry now, Sophia. You can't hold me off any longer. The Leonides family are out of it. She stared at me. I had never realized before the vivid blue of her eyes. Yes, she said. I suppose we're out of it now. We are out of it, aren't we? You're sure? My dear girl, none of you ever really had a shadow of motive. Her face went suddenly white. Except me, Charles. I had motive. Yes, of course. I was taken aback. But not really. You didn't know, you see, about the will. But I did, Charles, she whispered. What? I stared at her. I felt suddenly cold. I knew all the time that Grandfather had left his money to me. But how? He told me. About a fortnight before he was killed. He said to me quite suddenly, I've left all my money to you, Sophia. You must look after the family when I'm gone. I stared. You never told me. No. You see, when they all explained about the will and his signing it, I thought perhaps he had made a mistake that he was just imagining that he had left it to me, or that if he had made a will leaving it to me, then it had got lost and would never turn up. I didn't want it to turn up. I was afraid. Afraid? Why? I suppose because of murder. I remembered the look of terror on Brenda's face, the wild, unreasoning panic. I remembered the sheer panic that Magda had conjured up at will when she considered playing the part of a murderess. There would be no panic in Sophia's mind. But she was a realist, and she could see clearly enough that Leonides' will made her a suspect. I understood better now, or thought I did, her refusal to become engaged to me, and her insistence that I should find out the truth. Nothing but the truth, she had said, was any good to her. I remembered the passion, the earnestness with which she had said it. We had turned to walk towards the house, and suddenly, at a certain spot, I remembered something else she had said. She had said that she supposed she could murder someone. But if so, she had added, it must be for something really worthwhile. Chapter 22 Round a turn of the rock garden, Roger and Clemency came walking briskly towards us. Roger's flapping tweeds suited him better than his city clothes. He looked eager and excited. Clemency was frowning. Hello, you two, said Roger. At last. I thought they were never going to arrest that foul woman. What they've been waiting for, I don't know. Well, they've pinched her now, and a miserable boyfriend. I hope they hang them both. Clemency's frown increased. She said, Don't be so uncivilized, Roger. Uncivilized? Bosh! Deliberate cold-blooded poisoning of a helpless, trusting old man. And when I'm glad the murder is a court and will pay the penalty, you say I'm uncivilized. I tell you I'd willingly strangle that woman myself. He added, She was with you, wasn't she, when the police came for her? How did she take it? It was horrible, said Sophia in a low voice. She was scared out of her wits. So am I right. Don't be vindictive, said Clemency. Oh, I know, dearest, but you can't understand. It wasn't your father. I loved my father. Don't you understand? I loved him. I should understand by now, said Clemency. Roger said to her, half-jokingly, You've no imagination, Clemency. 
Suppose it had been I who had been poisoned. I saw the quick droop of her lids, the half-clenched hands. She said sharply, Don't say things like that, even in fun. Never mind, darling. We'll soon be away from all this. We moved towards the house. Roger and Sophia walked ahead, and Clemency and I brought up the rear. She said, I suppose now they'll let us go. Are you so anxious to get off? I asked. It's wearing me out. I looked at her in surprise. She met my glance with a faint, desperate smile and a nod of the head. Haven't you seen, Charles, that I'm fighting all the time? Fighting for my happiness, for Roger's? I've been so afraid the family would persuade him to stop in England, that we'd go on tangled up in the midst of them, stifled with family ties. I was afraid Sophia would offer him an income, and that he'd stay in England because it would mean greater comfort and amenities for me. The trouble with Roger is that he will not listen. He gets ideas in his head, and they're never the right ideas. He doesn't know anything, and he's enough of a Leonides to think that happiness for a woman is bound up with comfort and money. But I will fight for my happiness. I will. I will get Roger away and give him the life that suits him, where he won't feel a failure. I want him to myself, away from them all, right away. He had spoken in a low, hurried voice with a kind of desperation that startled me. I had not realized how much on edge she was. I had not realized either quite how desperate and possessive was her feeling for Roger. It brought back to my mind that odd quotation of Edith de Havilland's. She had quoted the line, This side idolatry, with a peculiar intonation. I wondered if she had been thinking of clemency. Roger, I thought, had loved his father better than he would ever love anyone else. Better even than his wife, devoted though he was to her. I realized for the first time how urgent was Clemency's desire to get her husband to herself. Love for Roger, I saw, made up her entire existence. He was her child, as well as her husband, and her lover. A car drove up to the front door. Hello, I said. Here's Josephine back. Josephine and Magda got out of the car. Josephine had a bandage round her head, but otherwise looked remarkably well. She said at once, I want to see my goldfish, and started towards us and the pond. Darling, cried Magda, you'd better come in first and lie down a little, and perhaps have a little nourishing soup. Don't fuss, mother, said Josephine. I'm quite all right, and I hate nourishing soup. Magda looked irresolute. I knew that Josephine had really been fit to depart from the hospital for some days, and that it was only a hint from Taverner that had kept her there. He was taking no chances on Josephine's safety until his suspects were safely under lock and key. I said to Magda, I dare say fresh air will do her good. I'll go and keep an eye on her. I caught Josephine up before she got to the pond. All sorts of things have been happening while you've been away, I said. Josephine did not reply. She peered with her short-sighted eyes into the pond. I don't see Ferdinand, she said. Which is Ferdinand? The one with four tails. Well, that kind is rather amusing. I like that bright gold one. It's quite a common one. I don't care much for that moth-eaten white one. Josephine cast me a scornful glance. But that's a ship bunkin. They cost a lot. Far more than goldfish. Don't you want to hear what's been happening, Josephine? I expect I know about it. Did you know that another will has been found and that your grandfather left all his money to Sophia? Josephine nodded in a bored kind of way. Mother told me. Anyway, I knew it already. Do you mean you heard it in the hospital? No, I mean I knew that Grandfather had left his money to Sophia. I heard him tell her so. Were you listening again? Yes. I like listening. It's a disgraceful thing to do. And remember this. Listeners hear no good of themselves. Josephine gave me a peculiar glance. I heard what he said about me to her, if that's what you mean. She added, Nanny gets wild if she catches me listening at doors. She says it's not the sort of thing a little lady does. She's quite right. Pooh, said Josephine. Nobody's a lady nowadays. They said so on the Brains Trust. They said it was obsolete. She pronounced the word carefully. I changed the subject. You've got home a bit late for the big event, I said. Chief Inspector Taverner has arrested Brenda and Lawrence. I expected that Josephine in her character of young detective, would be thrilled by this information. 
but she merely repeated in her maddening, bored fashion, Yes, I know. Well, you can't know. It's only just happened. The car passed us on the road. Inspector Taverner and the detective with the suede shoes were inside with Brenda and Lawrence, so of course I knew they must have been arrested. I hope he gave them the proper caution. You have to, you know. I assured her that Taverner had acted strictly according to etiquette. I had to tell him about the letters, I said apologetically. I found them behind the cistern. I'd have let you tell him, only you were knocked out. Josephine's hand went gingerly to her head. I ought to have been killed, she said with complacency. I told you it was about time for the second murder. The cistern was a rotten place to hide those letters. I guessed at once when I saw Lawrence coming out of there one day. I mean, he's not a useful kind of man, who does things with ball taps or pipes or fuses. So I knew he must have been hiding something. But I thought— I broke off as Edith de Havilland's voice called authoritatively. Josephine! Josephine! Come here at once! Josephine sighed. More fuss, she said. I'd better go. You have to if it's Aunt Edith. She ran across the lawn. I followed more slowly. After a brief interchange of words, Josephine went into the house. I joined Edith de Havilland on the terrace. This morning she looked fully her age. I was startled by the lines of weariness and suffering on her face. She looked exhausted and defeated. She saw the concern in my face and tried to smile. Well, that child seems none the worse for her adventure, she said. We must look after her better in future. Still, I suppose now it won't be necessary. She sighed and said, I am glad it's over, but what an exhibition. If you are arrested for murder, you might at least have some dignity. I've no patience with people like Brenda, who go to pieces and squeal. No guts, these people. Lawrence Brown looked like a cornered rabbit. An obscure instinct of pity rose in me. Poor devils, I said. Yes, poor devils. She'll have the sense to look after herself, I suppose. I mean, the right lawyers, all that sort of thing. It was queer, I thought, the dislike they all had for Brenda and their scrupulous care for her to have all the advantages for defence. Edith de Havilland went on. How long will it be? How long will the whole thing take? I said I didn't know exactly. They would be charged at the police court and presumably sent for trial. Three or four months, I estimated. And if convicted, there would be the appeal. Do you think they will be convicted? she asked. I don't know. I don't know exactly how much evidence the police have. There are letters. Love letters. They were lovers, then. They were in love with each other. Her face grew grimmer. I'm not happy about this, Charles. I don't like Brenda. In the past I've disliked her very much. I've said sharp things about her. But now I do feel that I want her to have every chance, every possible chance. Aristide would have wished that. I feel it's up to me to see that Brenda gets a square deal. And Lawrence? <laughs> Lawrence. She shrugged her shoulders impatiently. Men must look after themselves. But Aristide would never forgive us if— She left the sentence unfinished. Then she said, It must be almost lunchtime, or we'd better go in. I explained that I was going up to London. In your car? Yes. Hmm. I wonder if you'd take me with you. I gather we're allowed off the lead now. Well, of course I will. But I believe Magda and Sophia are going up after lunch. You'll be more comfortable with them than in my two-seater. I don't want to go with them. Take me with you. And uh, don't say much about it. I was surprised, but I did as she asked. We did not speak much on the way to town. I asked her where I should put her down. Harley Street. I felt some faint apprehension but I didn't like to say anything. She continued, oh, No, it's too early. Drop me at Debenham's. I can have some lunch there and go to Harley Street afterwards. I hope. I began and stopped. That's why I didn't want to go up with Magda. She dramatizes things. Lots of fuss. I'm very sorry, I said. No, oh, you needn't be. I've had a good life. A very good life. She gave a sudden grin. And it's not over yet. Chapter 23 
I had not seen my father for some days. I found him busy with things other than the Leonides case, and I went in search of Taverner. Taverner was enjoying a short spell of leisure, and was willing to come out and have a drink with me. I congratulated him on having cleared up the case, and he accepted my congratulation. But his manner remained far from jubilant. Well, that's over, he said. We've got a case. Nobody can deny we've got a case. Do you think you'll get a conviction? Impossible to say. The evidence is circumstantial. It nearly always is in a murder case. Bound to be. A lot depends on the impression they make on the jury. How far do the letters go? At first sight, Charles, they're pretty damning. There are references to their life together when her husband's dead, phrases like, It won't be long now. Mind you, defence counsel will try and twist it the other way. The husband was so old that, of course, they could reasonably expect him to die. There's no actual mention of poisoning— not down in black and white, but there are some passages that could mean that. It depends what judge we get. If it's old Carberry, he'll be down on them all through. He's always very righteous about illicit love. I suppose they'll have eagles or Humphrey Carr for the defence. Humphrey is magnificent in these cases, but he likes a gallant war record or something of that kind to help him do his stuff. A conscientious objector is going to cramp his style. The question is going to be, will the jury like them? You can never tell with juries. You know, Charles, those two are not really sympathetic characters. She's a good-looking woman who married a very old man for his money, and Brown is a neurotic, conscientious objector. The crime is so familiar, so according to pattern, that you really believe they didn't do it. Of course, they may decide that he did it, and she knew nothing about it, or alternately that she did it, and he didn't know about it, or they may decide that they were both in it together. And what do you yourself think? I asked. He looked at me with a wooden, expressionless face. Well, I don't think anything. I've turned in the facts, and they went to the DPP, and it was decided that there was a case. That's all. I've done my duty, and I'm out of it. So now you know, Charles. But I didn't know. I saw that for some reason Taverner was unhappy. It was not until three days later that I unburdened myself to my father. He himself had never mentioned the case to me. There had been a kind of restraint between us, and I thought I knew the reason for it. But I had to break down that barrier. Look, we've got to have this out, I said. Taverner's not satisfied that those two did it, and you're not satisfied either. My father shook his head. He said what Taverner had said. It's out of our hands. There's a case to answer. No question about that. But you don't, Taverner doesn't, think that they're guilty. That's for a jury to decide. For God's sake, I said, don't put me off with technical terms. What do you think, both of you, personally? My personal opinion is no better than yours, Charles. Yes, it is. You've more experience. Then I'll be honest with you. I just don't know. They could be guilty? Well, yes. But you don't feel sure that they are? My father shrugged his shoulders. How can one be sure? Don't fence with me, Dad. You've been sure other times, haven't you? Dead sure. No doubt in your mind at all. Well, sometimes, yes. Not always. I wish to God you were sure this time. Well, so do I. We were silent. I was thinking of those two figures drifting in from the garden in the dusk, lonely and haunted and afraid. They had been afraid from the start. Didn't that show a guilty conscience? But I answered myself, not necessarily. Both Brenda and Lawrence were afraid of life. They had no confidence in themselves, in their ability to avoid danger and defeat, and they could see only too clearly the pattern of illicit love leading to murder which might involve them at any moment. My father spoke, and his voice was grave and kind. Come, Charles, he said, let's face it. You've still got it in your mind, haven't you, that one of the Leonides family is the real culprit? Not really. I only wonder— You do think so. You may be wrong, but you do think so. Yes, I said. Why? Because— I thought about it, trying to see clearly, to bring my wits to bear. Because— Yes, that was it. Because they think so themselves. They think so themselves. That's interesting. 
That's very interesting. Do you mean that they all suspect each other? Or that they know, actually, who did it? I'm not sure, I said. It's all very nebulous and confused. I think, on the whole, that they try to cover up the knowledge from themselves. My father nodded. Not Roger, I said. Roger wholeheartedly believes it was Brenda, and he wholeheartedly wants her hanged. It's a relief to be with Roger, because he's simple and positive and hasn't any reservations in the back of his mind. But the others are apologetic. They're uneasy. They urge me to be sure that Brenda has the best defence, that every possible advantage is given her. Why? My father answered, Because they don't really, in their hearts, believe she's guilty. Yes, that's sound. Then he asked quietly, Who could have done it? You've talked to them all. Who's the best bet? I don't know, I said, and it's driving me frantic. None of them fits your sketch of a murderer, and yet I feel, I do feel that one of them is a murderer. Sophia? No, good God, no. The possibility's in your mind, Charles. Yes, it is. Don't deny it. All the more potently, because you won't acknowledge it. What about the others? Philip? Only for the most fantastic motive. Motives can be fantastic. Or they can be absurdly slight. What's his motive? He's bitterly jealous of Roger. Always has been all his life. His father's preference for Roger drove Philip in upon himself. Roger was about to crash. Then the old man heard of it. He promised to put Roger on his feet again. Supposing Philip learned that, if the old man died that night, there would be no assistance for Roger. Roger would be down and out. I know it's absurd. Oh, no, it isn't. It's abnormal, but it happens. It's human. What about Magda? Well, she's rather childish. She, she gets things out of proportion. But I would never have thought twice about her being involved if it hadn't been for the sudden way she wanted to pack Josephine off to Switzerland. I couldn't help feeling that she was afraid of something that Josephine knew or might say. And then Josephine was conked on the head. Well, that couldn't be her mother. Why not? But, Dad, a mother wouldn't— Charles, Charles, don't you ever read the police news? Again and again a mother takes a dislike to one of her children. Only one? She may be devoted to the others. There's some association, some reason, but it's often hard to get at. But when it exists, it's an unreasoning aversion. And it's very strong. She called Josephine a changeling, I admitted unwillingly. Did the child mind? I don't think so. Who else is there? Roger? Roger didn't kill his father, I'm quite sure of that. Wash out Roger, then. His wife, what's her name? Clemency? Yes, I said. If she killed old Leonides, it was for a very odd reason. I told him of my conversation with Clemency. I said I thought it possible that in her passion to get Roger away from England she might have deliberately poisoned the old man. She persuaded Roger to go without telling his father. Then the old man found out. He was going to back up associated catering. All Clemency's hopes and plans were frustrated, and she really does care desperately for Roger, beyond idolatry. You're repeating what Edith de Havilland said. Yes, and Edith's another whom I think might have done it. But I don't know why. I can only believe that for what she considered a good and sufficient reason she might take the law into her own hands. She's that kind of person. And she also was very anxious that Brenda should be adequately defended. Yes, but that, I suppose, might be conscience. I don't think for a moment that if she did do it, she intended them to be accused of the crime. Probably not. But would she knock out the child, Josephine? No, I said slowly. I can't believe that. Which reminds me that there's something that Josephine said to me that keeps nagging at my mind, and I can't remember what it is. It slipped my memory, but it's something that doesn't fit in where it should. If only I could remember. Uh, never mind. It'll come back. Anything or anyone else on your mind? Yes, I said, very much so. How much do you know about infantile paralysis? It's after effects on character, I mean. Eustace? Yes, the more I think about it, the more it seems to me that Eustace might fit the bill. His dislike and resentment against his grandfather, his queerness and moodiness, he's not normal. 
He's the only one of the family who I can see knocking out Josephine quite callously if she knew something about him. And she's quite likely to know. That child knows everything. She writes it down in a little book. I stopped. Good Lord, I said. What a fool I am! What's the matter? I know now what was wrong. We assumed, Tavener and I, that the wrecking of Josephine's room, the frantic search, was for those letters. I thought that she'd got hold of them, and that she'd hidden them up in the cistern room. But when she was talking to me the other day, she made it quite clear that it was Lawrence who had hidden them there. She saw him coming out of the cistern room, and went snooping round and found the letters. Then, of course, she read them. She would, but she left them where they were. Well, don't you see? It couldn't have been the letters someone was looking for in Josephine's room. It must have been something else. And that something was the little black book she writes down her detection in. That's what someone was looking for. I think, too, that whoever it was didn't find it. I think Josephine still has it, but if so... I half rose. If so, said my father, she still isn't safe. Is that what you were going to say? Yes. She won't be out of danger until she's actually started for Switzerland. They're planning to send her there, you know. Does she want to go? I considered. I don't think she does. Then she probably hasn't gone, said my father dryly. But I think you're right about the danger. You'd better get down there. Eustace? I cried desperately. Clemency? My father said gently, To my mind, the facts point clearly in one direction. I wonder you don't see it yourself. I— Glover opened the door. A big pardon, Mr. Charles? At the telephone. Miss Leonides speaking from Swindley Dean. It's urgent. It seemed like a horrible repetition. Had Josephine again fallen a victim, and had the murderer this time made no mistake? I hurried to the telephone. Sophia, it's Charles here. Sophia's voice came with a kind of hard desperation in it. Charles, it isn't all over. The murderer is still here. What on earth do you mean? What is wrong? Is it Josephine? It's not Josephine. It's Nanny. Nanny? Yes. There was some cocoa. Josephine's cocoa. She didn't drink it. She left it on the table. Nanny thought it was a pity to waste it, so she drank it. Poor Nanny. Is she very bad? Sophia's voice broke. Oh, Charles! She's dead! Chapter 24 We were back again in the nightmare. That is what I thought as Tavener and I drove out of London. It was a repetition of our former journey. At intervals, Tavener swore. As for me, I repeated from time to time, stupidly, unprofitably, so it wasn't Brenda and Lawrence. It wasn't Brenda and Lawrence. Had I really thought it was? I had been so glad to think it, so glad to escape from other, more sinister possibilities. They had fallen in love with each other. They had written silly, sentimental, romantic letters to each other. They had indulged in hopes that Brenda's old husband might soon die peacefully and happily. But I wondered, really, if they had even acutely desired his death. I had a feeling that the despairs and longings of an unhappy love affair suited them as well or better than commonplace married life together. I didn't think Brenda was really passionate. She was too anemic, too apathetic. It was romance she craved for. And I thought Lawrence, too, was the type to enjoy frustration and vague future dreams of bliss rather than the concrete satisfaction of the flesh. They had been caught in a trap, and, terrified, they had not had the wit to find their way out. Lawrence, with incredible stupidity, had not even destroyed Brenda's letters. Presumably Brenda had destroyed his, since they had not been found. And it was not Lawrence who had balanced the marble doorstop on the washhouse door. It was someone else whose face was still hidden behind a mask. We drove up to the door. Tavener got out, and I followed him. There was a plain-clothes man in the hall whom I didn't know. He saluted Tavener, and Tavener drew him aside. My attention was taken by a pile of luggage in the hall. It was labelled and ready for departure. As I looked at it, Clemency came down the stairs and through the open door at the bottom. She was dressed in her same red dress with a tweed coat over it and a red felt hat. You're in time to say goodbye, Charles, she said. You're leaving? We go to London tonight. Our plane goes early tomorrow morning. 
She was quiet and smiling, but I thought her eyes were watchful. But surely you can't go now? Why not? Her voice was hard. With this death? Nanny's death has nothing to do with us. Perhaps not, but all the same. Why do you say perhaps not? It has nothing to do with us. Roger and I have been upstairs, finishing packing up. We did not come down at all during the time that the cocoa was left on the hall table. Can you prove that? I can answer for Roger, and Roger can answer for me. No more than that? Your man and wife, remember? Her anger flamed out. You're impossible, Charles. Roger and I are going away to lead our own life. Why on earth should we want to poison a nice, stupid old woman who had never done us any harm? It might have been her you meant to poison. Still less likely are we to poison a child. It depends rather on the child, doesn't it? What do you mean? Josephine isn't quite the ordinary child. She knows a good deal about people. She— I broke off. Josephine had emerged from the door leading to the drawing-room. She was eating the inevitable apple, and over its round rosiness her eyes sparkled with a kind of ghoulish enjoyment. Nanny's been poisoned, she said, just like Grandfather. It's awfully exciting, isn't it? Aren't you at all upset about it? I demanded severely. You were fond of her, weren't you? Not particularly. She was always scolding me about something or other. She fussed. Are you fond of anybody, Josephine? asked Clemency. Josephine turned her ghoulish eyes towards Clemency. I love Aunt Edith, she said. I love Aunt Edith very much, and I could love Eustace, only he's always such a beast to me and won't be interested in finding out who did all this. You'd better stop finding things out, Josephine, I said. It isn't very safe. I don't need to find out any more, said Josephine. I know. There was a moment's silence. Josephine's eyes, solemn and unwinking, were fixed on Clemency. A sound like a long sigh reached my ears. I swung sharply round. Edith de Havilland stood halfway down the staircase, but I did not think it was she who had sighed. The sound had come from behind the door through which Josephine had just come. I stepped sharply across to it and yanked it open. There was no one to be seen. Nevertheless, I was seriously disturbed. Someone had stood just within that door and had heard those words of Josephine's. I went back and took Josephine by the arm. She was eating her apple and staring stolidly at Clemency. Behind the solemnity there was, I thought, a certain malignant satisfaction. Come on, Josephine, I said. We're going to have a little talk. I think Josephine might have protested, but I was not standing any nonsense. I ran her along forcibly into her own part of the house. There was a small, unused morning room where we could be reasonably sure of being undisturbed. I took her in there, closed the door firmly, and made her sit on a chair. I took another chair and drew it forward so that I faced her. Now, Josephine, I said, we're going to have a showdown. What exactly do you know? Lots of things. That I have no doubt about. That noddle of yours is probably crammed to overflowing with relevant and irrelevant information. But you know perfectly well what I mean, don't you? Of course I do. I'm not stupid. I didn't know whether the disparagement was for me or the police, but I paid no attention to it, and went on. You know who put something in your cocoa? Josephine nodded. You know who poisoned your grandfather? Josephine nodded again. And who knocked you on the head? Again Josephine nodded. Then you're going to come across with what you know. You're going to tell me all about it. Now. Shan't. You've got to. Every bit of information you've got, or have ferreted out, has got to be given to the police. I won't tell the police anything. They're stupid. They thought Brenda had done it, or Lawrence. I wasn't stupid like that. I knew jolly well they hadn't done it. I've had an idea who it was all along, and then I made a kind of test, and now I know I'm right. She finished on a triumphant note. I prayed to heaven for patience and started again. Listen, Josephine. I dare say you're extremely clever. Josephine looked gratified. But it won't be much good to you to be clever if you're not alive to enjoy the fact. Don't you see, you little fool, that as long as you keep your secrets in this silly way, you're in imminent danger? Josephine nodded approvingly. Of course I am. Already you've had two very narrow escapes. One attempt nearly did for you, the other has cost somebody else their life. 
Don't you see, if you go on strutting about the house and proclaiming at the top of your voice that you know who the killer is, there will be more attempts made, and that either you'll die or somebody else will. In some books, person after person is killed, Josephine informed me with gusto. You end by spotting the murderer because he or she is practically the only person left. This isn't a detective story. This is Three Gables, Swinley Dean, and you're a silly little girl who's read more than is good for her. I'll make you tell me what you know if I have to shake you till your teeth rattle. I could always tell you something that wasn't true. You could, but you won't. What are you waiting for, anyway? You don't understand, said Josephine. Perhaps I may never tell. You see, I might be fond of the person. She paused, as though to let this sink in. And if I do tell, she went on, I shall do it properly. I shall have everybody sitting round, and then I'll go over it all with the clues, and then I shall say, quite suddenly, and it was you. She thrust out a dramatic forefinger, just as Edith de Havilland entered the room. Put that cord in the waste paper basket, Josephine, said Edith. Have you got a handkerchief? Your fingers are sticky. I'm taking you out in the car. Her eyes met mine with significance as she said, You'll be safer out of here for the next hour or so. As Josephine looked mutinous, Edith added, We'll go into Longbridge and have an ice cream soda. Josephine's eyes brightened, and she said, Two. Perhaps, said Edith. Now, go and get your hat and coat and your dark blue scarf. It's cold out today. Charles, you had better go with her while she gets them. Don't leave her. I have just a couple of notes to write. She sat down at the desk, and I escorted Josephine out of the room. Even without Edith's warning, I would have stuck to Josephine like a leech. I was convinced that there was danger to the child very near at hand. As I finished superintending Josephine's toilet, Sophia came into the room. She seemed rather astonished to see me. Why? Charles, have you turned nursemaid? I didn't know you were here. I'm going to Longbridge with Aunt Edith, said Josephine importantly. We're going to have ice creams. <laughs> On a day like this, ice cream sodas are always lovely, said Josephine. When you're cold inside, it makes you feel hotter outside. Sophia frowned. She looked worried, and I was shocked by her pallor and the circles under her eyes. We went back to the morning room. Edith was just blotting a couple of envelopes. She got up briskly. We'll start now, she said. I told Evans to bring round the Ford. She swept out into the hall. We followed her. My eye was again caught by the suitcases and their blue labels. For some reason they aroused in me a vague disquietude. It's quite a nice day, said Edith de Havilland, pulling on her gloves and glancing up at the sky. The Ford Ten was waiting in front of the house. Cold but bracing. A real English autumn day. How beautiful trees look with their bare branches against the sky, and just a golden leaf or two still hanging. She was silent a moment or two. Then she turned and kissed Sophia. Goodbye, dear, she said. Don't worry too much. Certain things have to be faced and endured. Then she said, Come, Josephine, and got into the car. Josephine climbed in beside her. They both waved as the car drove off. I suppose she's right, and it's better to keep Josephine out of this for a while, but we've got to make that child tell us what she knows, Sophia. She probably doesn't know anything. She's just showing off. Josephine likes to make herself look important, you know. It's more than that. Do they know what poison it was in the cocoa? But they think it's digitalin. Aunt Edith takes digitalin for her heart. She has a whole bottle full of little tablets up in her room. Now the bottle's empty. She ought to keep things like that locked up. She did. I suppose it wouldn't be difficult for someone to find out where she hid the key. Someone? Who? I looked again at the pile of luggage. I said suddenly and loudly, They can't go away. They mustn't be allowed to. Sophia looked surprised. Roger and Clemency? Charles, you don't think— Well, what do you think? Sophia stretched out her hands in a helpless gesture. I don't know, Charles, she whispered. I only know that I'm back, back in the nightmare. I know. Those were the very words I used to myself as I drove down with Taverner. 
because this is just what a nightmare is. Walking about among people you know, looking in their faces, and suddenly the faces change, and it's not someone you know any longer. It's a stranger, a cruel stranger. She cried, Come outside, Charles, come outside. It's safer outside. I'm afraid to stay in this house. Chapter 25 we stayed in the garden a long time. By a kind of tacit consent, we did not discuss the horror that was weighing upon us. Instead, Sophia talked affectionately of the dead woman, of things they had done and games they had played as children with Nanny, and tales that the old woman used to tell them about Roger and their father and the other brothers and sisters. They were her real children, you see. She only came back to us to help during the war, when Josephine was a baby and Eustace was a funny little boy. There was a certain balm for Sophia in these memories, and I encouraged her to talk. I wondered what Taverner was doing. Questioning the household, I supposed. A car drove away with the police photographer and two other men, and presently an ambulance drove up. Sophia shivered a little. Presently the ambulance left, and we knew that Nanny's body had been taken away in preparation for an autopsy. And still we sat or walked in the garden and talked our words becoming more and more of a cloak for our real thoughts. Finally, with a shiver, Sophia said, It must be very late. It's almost dark. We've got to go in. Aunt Edith and Josephine haven't come back. Surely they ought to be back by now. A vague uneasiness woke in me. What had happened? Was Edith deliberately keeping the child away from the crooked house? We went in. Sophia drew all the curtains. The fire was lit, and the big drawing-room looked harmonious, with an unreal air of bygone luxury. Great bowls of bronze chrysanthemums stood on the tables. Sophia rang, and a maid, whom I recognized as having been formerly upstairs, brought in tea. She had red eyes and sniffed continuously. Also I noticed that she had a frightened way of glancing quickly over her shoulder. Magda joined us, but Philip's tea was sent to him in the library. Magda's role was a stiff, frozen image of grief. She spoke little or not at all. She said once, Where are Edith and Josephine? They're out very late. But she said it in a preoccupied kind of way. But I myself was becoming increasingly uneasy. I asked if Taverner was still in the house, and Magda replied that she thought so. I went in search of him. I told him that I was worried about Mr. Haviland and the child. He went immediately to the telephone and gave certain instructions. I'll let you know when I have news, he said. I thanked him and went back to the drawing-room. Sophia was there with Eustace. Magda had gone. He'll let us know if he hears anything, I said to Sophia. She said in a low voice, Something's happened, Charles. Something must have happened. My dear Sophia, it's not really late yet. What are you bothering about? said Eustace. They've probably gone to the cinema. He lounged out of the room. I said to Sophia, She may have taken Josephine to a hotel, or up to London. I, I think she really realized that the child was in danger. Perhaps she realized it better than we did. Sophia replied with a somber look that I could not quite fathom. She kissed me goodbye. I did not see quite what she meant by that disconnected remark, or what it was supposed to show. I asked if Magda was worried. Mother? No, she's all right. She's no sense of time. She's reading a new play of Vavasor Jones called The Woman Disposes. It's a funny play about murder. A female bluebeard, cribbed from Arsting and Old Lace, if you ask me. But it's got a good woman's part, a woman who's got a mania for being a widow. I said no more. We sat, pretending to read. It was half-past six when Taverner opened the door and came in. His face prepared us for what he had to say. Sophia got up. Yes, she said. I'm sorry, I've got bad news for you. I sent out a general alarm for the car. A motorist reported having seen a Ford car with a number something like that turning off the main road at Flaxpur Heath, through the woods. Not the track to Flaxpur Quarry? Yes, Miss Leonides. He paused and went on. The car's been found in the quarry. Both the occupants were dead. 
You'll be glad to know they were killed outright. Josephine! It was Magda standing in the doorway. Her voice rose in a wail. Josephine! My baby! Sophia went to her and put her arms round her. I said, Wait a minute. I had remembered something. Edith de Havilland, writing a couple of letters at the desk, going out into the hall with them in her hand. But they had not been in her hand when she got into the car. I dashed out into the hall and went to the long oak chest. I found the letters pushed inconspicuously to the back behind a brass tea urn. The uppermost was addressed to Chief Inspector Taverner. Taverner had followed me. I handed the letter to him, and he tore it open. Standing beside him, I read its brief contents. My expectation is that this will be opened after my death. I wish to enter into no details, but I accept full responsibility for the deaths of my brother-in-law, Aristide Leonides, and Janet Rowe, Nanny. I hereby solemnly declare that Brenda Leonides and Lawrence Brown are innocent of the murder of Aristide Leonides. Inquiry of Dr. Michael Chavas, 783 Harley Street, will confirm that my life could only have been prolonged for a few months. I prefer to take this way out, and to spare two innocent people the ordeal of being charged with a murder they did not commit. I am of sound mind, and fully conscious of what I write. Edith Elfrida de Havilland As I finished the letter, I was aware that Sophia too had read it. Whether with Taverner's concurrence or not, I don't know. Aunt Edith, murmured Sophia. I remembered Edith de Havilland's ruthless foot grinding bindweed into the earth. I remembered my early, almost fanciful suspicions of her. But why? Sophia spoke the thought in my mind before I came to it. But why Josephine? Why did she take Josephine with her? Why did she do it at all? I demanded. What was her motive? But even as I said that, I knew the truth. I saw the whole thing clearly. I realized that I was still holding her second letter in my hand. I looked down and saw my own name on it. It was thicker and harder than the other one. I think I knew what was in it before I opened it. I tore the envelope along, and Josephine's little black notebook fell out. I picked it up off the floor. It came open in my hand, and I saw the entry on the first page. Sounding from a long way away, I heard Sophia's voice clear and self-controlled. We've got it all wrong, she said. Edith didn't do it. No, I said. Sophia came closer to me. She whispered, It was Josephine. Wasn't it? That was it. Josephine. Together, we looked down on the first entry in the little black book, written in an unformed, childish hand. Today, I killed Grandfather. Chapter 26 I was to wonder afterwards that I could have been so blind. The truth had stuck out so clearly all along. Josephine, and only Josephine, fitted in with all the necessary qualifications. Her vanity, her persistent self-importance, her delight in talking, her reiteration on how clever she was and how stupid the police were. I had never considered her because she was a child, but children have committed murders and this particular murder had been well within a child's compass. Her grandfather himself had indicated the precise method. He had practically handed her a blueprint. All she had to do was to avoid leaving fingerprints, and the slightest knowledge of detection fiction would teach her that. And everything else had been a mere hodgepodge, culled at random from stock mystery stories. The notebook, the sleuthing, her pretended suspicions— her insistence that she was not going to tell till she was sure. And finally, the attack on herself, an almost incredible performance, considering she might easily have killed herself. But then, childlike, she had never considered such a possibility. She was the heroine, 
the heroine isn't killed. Yet there had been a clue there, the traces of earth on the seat of the old chair in the wash house. Josephine was the only person who would have had to climb up on a chair to balance the block of marble on the top of the door. Obviously, it had missed her more than once, the dints in the floor, and patiently she had climbed up again and replaced it, handling it with her scarf to avoid fingerprints. And then it had fallen, and she had had a near escape from death. It had been the perfect setup, the impression she was aiming for. She was in danger. She knew something. She had been attacked. I saw how she had deliberately drawn my attention to her presence in the cistern room, and she had completed the artistic disorder of her room before going out to the wash house. But when she had returned from hospital, when she had found Brenda and Lawrence arrested, she must have become dissatisfied. The case was over, and she, Josephine, was out of the limelight. So she stole the digitalin from Edith's room and put it in her own cup of cocoa and left the cup untouched on the hall table. Did she know that Nanny would drink it? Possibly. From her words that morning she had resented Nanny's criticisms of her. Did Nanny perhaps, wise from a lifetime of experience with children, suspect? I think that Nanny knew, had always known that Josephine was not normal. With her precocious mental development had gone a retarded moral sense. Perhaps, too, the various factors of heredity, what Sophia had called the ruthlessness of the family, had met together. She had had the authoritarian ruthlessness of her grandmother's family and the ruthless egoism of Magda, seeing only her own point of view. She had also presumably suffered, sensitive like Philip, from the stigma of being the unattractive, the changeling child of the family. Finally, in her very marrow, had run the essential crooked strain of old Leonides. She had been Leonides' grandchild. She had resembled him in brain and in cunning. But where his love had gone outwards to family and friends, hers had turned inward to herself. I thought that old Leonides had realized what none of the rest of the family had realized, that Josephine might be a source of danger to others and to herself. He had kept her from school life because he was afraid of what she might do. He had shielded her and guarded her in the home, and I understood now his urgency to Sophia to look after Josephine. Magda's sudden decision to send Josephine abroad, had that, too, been due to a fear for the child? Not perhaps a conscious fear, but some vague maternal instinct. And Edith de Havilland, had she first suspected, then feared, and finally known? I looked down at the letter in my hand. Dear Charles, this is in confidence for you, and for Sophia, if you so decide. It is imperative that someone should know the truth. I found the enclosed in the disused dog kennel outside the back door. She kept it there. It confirms what I already suspected. The action I am about to take may be right or wrong. I do not know. But my life, in any case, is close to its end, and I do not want the child to suffer as I believe she would suffer if called to earthly account for what she has done. There is often one of the litter who is not quite right. If I am wrong, God forgive me. But I did it out of love. God bless you both. Edith de Havilland I hesitated for only a moment. Then I handed the letter to Sophia. Together we again opened Josephine's little black book. Today I killed Grandfather. We turned the pages. It was an amazing production. Interesting, I should imagine, to a psychologist. It set out, with such terrible clarity, the fury of thwarted egoism. The motive for the crime was set down, pitifully childish and inadequate. Grandfather wouldn't let me do ballet dancing, so I made up my mind I would kill him. Then we should go to London and live, and Mother wouldn't mind me doing ballet. I give only a few entries. They are all significant. I don't want to go to Switzerland. I won't go. If Mother makes me, I will kill her too. Only I can't get any poison. Perhaps I could make it with Uberies. They are poisonous. The book says so. 
Eustace has made me very cross today. He says I am only a girl, and no use, and that it's silly my detecting. He wouldn't think me silly if he knew it was me did the murders. I like Charles, but he is rather stupid. I have not decided yet who I shall make have done the crime. Perhaps Brenda and Lawrence. Brenda is nasty to me. She says I am not all there. But I like Lawrence. He told me about Charlotte Corday. She killed someone in his bath. She was not very clever about it. The last entry was revealing. I hate Nanny. I hate her. I hate her. She says I am only a little girl. She says I show off. She's making Mother send me abroad. I'm going to kill her, too. I think Aunt Edith's medicine would do it. If there is another murder, then the police will come back, and it will all be exciting again. Nanny's dead. I'm glad. I haven't decided yet where I'll hide the bottle with the little pill things. Perhaps in Aunt Clemency's room, or else Eustace. When I am dead, as an old woman— I shall leave this behind me, addressed to the chief of police, and they will see what a really great criminal I was. I closed the book. Sophia's tears were flowing fast. Charles! Oh, Charles, it's so dreadful! She's such a little monster, and yet it's so terribly pathetic! I had felt the same. I had liked Josephine. I still felt a fondness for her. You do not like anyone less because they have tuberculosis or some other fatal disease. Josephine was, as Sophia had said, a little monster, but she was a pathetic little monster. She had been born with a kink, the crooked child of the little crooked house. Sophia asked, If she had lived, what would have happened? I suppose she would have been sent to a reformatory or a special school. Later she would have been released, or possibly certified, I don't know. Sophia shuddered. It's better the way it is. But Aunt Edith, I don't like to think of her taking the blame. She chose to do so. I don't suppose it will be made public. I imagine that when Brenda and Lawrence come to trial, no case will be brought against them, and they will be discharged. And you, Sophia, I said, this time on a different note, and taking both her hands in mine, will marry me. I've just heard I'm appointed to Persia. We will go out there together, and you will forget the little crooked house. Your mother can put on plays, and your father can buy more books, and Eustace will soon go to a university. Don't worry about them any more. Think of me. Sophia looked me straight in the eyes. Aren't you afraid, Charles, to marry me? Why should I be? In poor little Josephine all the worst of the family came together. In you, Sophia, I fully believe that all that is bravest and best in the Leonides family has been handed down to you. Your grandfather thought highly of you, and he seems to have been a man who was usually right. Hold up your head, my darling. The future is ours. I will, Charles. I love you, and I'll marry you and make you happy. She looked down at the notebook. Poor Josephine. Poor Josephine, I said. What's the truth of it, Charles? said my father. I never lie to the old man. It... Wasn't Edith de Havilland, sir, I said. It was Josephine. My father nodded his head gently. Yes, he said. I've thought so for some time. Poor child.